Just press the button. You know, the Lord's been speaking to me about a transition that's happening. And he was talking to me about how the kingdom of Saul is at war with the kingdom of David. And I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> you ever read a scripture, you've read it 20 times, and you still don't know what it means, man? That's me sometimes, man, you know? But he's been revealing it to me. He's been showing it to me. And he's been talking to me about having an eternal perspective of his heart. See, Genesis 1.26 says this. We were made for his image. We were made for his image, man. But you got to understand, he said, let us. Who was he talking to? It was the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit talking. Let us make man in our image. Because each one of them has an inheritance in us. The Father's inheritance is a family of sons and daughters that would reveal who he is in the earth. Jesus' inheritance is a bride without spot or blemish. A beautiful bride. The Holy Spirit's inheritance is you and me. We're his dwelling place. We're the temple of the living God. Let us make man in our image. We have to have an eternal perspective of things. You are his answer in a crooked and perverse generation. Sooner or later, we got to get this revelation that it's not about us, it's about God. Sooner or later, we got to believe the songs we sing. The Lord's been talking to me about the Father's heart. He's been doing some internal restoration, cleansing stuff in me. And I guess this is where all this is coming from, amen? But he's been talking to me about the Father's heart, a Father's heart. And he was talk, talking to me about Saul's kingdom versus David's kingdom. See, a true father will always point you to Jesus. A true father. See, the church has become a family of orphans led by orphans. See, Genesis 1.11 says a seed reproduces after its own kind. So if the father wasn't father, Saul was worried about Saul, wasn't he? I'm going to show you that right here in the scriptures in a second. Man. But not David. David was about the presence of God, man. See, a true father understands that other giftings and other talents glorify our Father. They understand that in the presence there's lots of room. See, Saul was focused on building his kingdom. Saul was focused on building his kingdom. David was focused on the presence. David was focused on the presence. It's all about the presence. Let's go to 2 Samuel 3.1. 2 Samuel 3.1. Oh, we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David grew stronger and stronger and stronger. And the house of Saul 
grew weaker and weaker and weaker. There's a clash going on right now, man. See, a true father focuses on leaving legacy. That means the seed of Genesis 1.11 reproduces after its own kind. See, this is our problem in North America, man. We have too many churches. We have too many ministers and ministries, man, that are like the house of Saul. They're like the house of Saul. Go back to 1 Samuel 13, 22. I want to show you something. All of the people that are at war, the whole nation, but none of them got weapons. Saul's the king. He's the father. He's the apostolic authority. But none of them have weapons except Saul and his family. So it came about on the day of battle, on the day of warfare. See, if a seed is reproducing all after its own kind, where it's going to happen to you on the day of battle? What's going to happen on the day of warfare? So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan. But they were found in Saul and Jonathan, his son. Wow. Wow. A majority of the Western church is a family of orphans led by orphans. That's why there's no authority and power flowing in most of it, man. Because the leadership are orphans that have never been fathered. So they've reproduced. True fathers, divinic fathers, that seek the presence and point us to God our Father, and make themselves of no reputation. But are here to reproduce after their own kind. The, in the present. True fathers, they build for legacy. That their spiritual sons and daughters will go further and be more successful than they ever were. They don't need to be seen and heard all the time. You know, I thank God for my apostolic authority. They never ask me, Steve, how's ministry been going? How many people got healed? How many people got saved? How many? No. They just ask me, how are you doing? How's your family? What's going on in your heart and head? What's God saying? They're praying for me and prophesying over me. But a true father will always be surrounded. They will duplicate themselves with people of authority and power and sons and daughters of the presence because they're a father of the presence. They don't need to always preach and teach. They don't need to be seen and heard and make sure they're okay, but, well, I guess they just need a pray more. No, man, you got to build to leave a legacy. See, Saul, the kingdom of Saul values position over presence. It values position over presence. But David valued the presence above all. David. 
freestyle king. Prophetic worship to the Lord while he's sitting there in the field by himself. Man. He knew where his help came from. Because he's killed the lions and the bears. When nobody was around. That's what qualifies you to kill the Goliaths in the open. We say, here I am, Lord. Use me. Well, man, you got to get in that secret place. you got to kill some lions and bears, buddy. You're going to world change. It's going to happen for you. But <coughs> Saul valued position over the presence. Hey, I'm the pastor here. Oops. I'm the apostle. Well, let me see your sons and daughters, man. Are they moving in authority and power and valuing the presence above all things? Have they made themselves of no reputation where they are nothing so that they can be something for him? John 12, 24 says, unless the seed dies, unless you die to yourself, to your agenda, to thoughts, feelings, and emotions that don't produce life, you will abide alone. You will be like Saul. Maybe you and yours will be okay, but you will never reproduce and duplicate to leave a legacy to make your daddy known in the earth. Remember, you're his inheritance, man. That's why I love the woman with the alabaster box, man. They said, right, that was probably worth $50,000. That was worth some, some type of inheritance. But she went in to pour it on Jesus, her whole inheritance. What price are you paying for your inheritance? What price are you paying? I can't even pray. <laughs> I gotta go to work. Get up an hour early, man. Come on. <laughs> Come on. I'll tell you, if they were passing out the $100 bills before work, you'd be there. Oh, I promise you you would. Saul was building his own kingdom. He was self-centered. He was selfish, man. See, when you value the presence, you make room for others to come in. Because you understand there's plenty of room in your father's house, man. You understand that. You understand, man. You won't drive out gifted people because you're jealous and insecure like Saul was. That's what some fathers do. Oh no. He's not anointed. She's not anointed. They try to drive it out because they're jealous. Saul was jealous of David. He was insecure. He spent all his time trying chasing David around because he was supposed to be the next king, trying to kill him. But all the time, the enemy was whooping the Israelites. Saul lost the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. He lost it. And second... Samuel 6, the first thing David did when he became king was go get the ark back. Go get the presence of God back, man. It's the first thing he did, man. See, when you're under the old, the kingdom of Saul, <laughs> when you're under the kingdom of Saul, you're building your own kingdom. You're threatened by other people's giftings, graces, and anointings on their life. You are. You're threatened by it, man. This guy's called to be a prophet, and you got him hanging out front, ushering and not hearing the word of God. But he should be in there prophesying over people. 
Do you see the wildness we have in here? Why? Because I honor the graces. I honor the graces when somebody's praying for the sick over there, when somebody's cracking up in mad laughter over here, when somebody's crying out over here, when somebody's on their face praying in tongues over here, when they're praying for the sick over there. It's just all happening at once. Believe me, God's a multitasker, man. But you've got to honor what's on people's lives. You've got to honor it, man. Saul wanted the limelight. He didn't want legacy. He didn't want the presence. Fathers build for family. Fathers disciple. The fathers love you through your identity crisis. They don't point the finger at you and beat you down or try to manipulate you and control you because they're building their own kingdom and sell you. God knows, man. You got to understand, man. Saul fought for position. You don't have to fight for position. You just have to get in the presence of God. But you got to be wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. You got to be. See, you understand, orphans, Saul's kingdom, they lived and strived for a father's acceptance. David and Davidic fathers, they lead from a place of knowing they're accepted. Big difference there. Real fathers will knock out selfish ambition out of you. Again, I'm so grateful for my apostolic authority. They'll say, Steve, no. Hey, no, stop it, Steve. It's not God. They're in that secret place confirming everything God's already told you. They're sitting there leading and guiding you so that you can mature in the grace that's on your life, whether it be for business, whether it be for ministry, whether it be so you can reproduce it in your wife and your children. <coughs> So whether you can get the right wife and eventually have godly children, whatever the case may be. But you got to understand, there's a process involved. There's a process. You got to understand, sonship has nothing to do with ministry. God measures success by your closeness, by your proximity to the throne. And guess what? No titles are allowed in the throne. That's a good you got to cast your crowns at his feet. No titles allowed, man, in the throne room. It's just you and Papa. It's just you and Dad, him loving on you. You beholding him and becoming like him in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says that we behold him as in a mirror and we get changed and transformed from this state of glory to another state of glory because we have our eyes fixed on Jesus, Hebrews 2. Our eyes are fixed on Jesus, but it's because we hang out at the throne because we acknowledge him in all our ways and he directs our paths, for he leads us down paths of righteousness for his name's sake. For we cry out all day, oh Lord, search my heart. See if there be any wicked way of me. Try me and know me. Lord, break me and bend me. Oh Lord, make me nothing so that I can be all in for your will and purposes. See the fire burns hottest in the secret place. Whoa. The fire burns hottest in the secret place. The orphan 
fathers are all in competition with churches. I got a smoke machine. I got this. I got that. Oh, my God, man. David said, none of that matters. It's the presence that matters. It's the glory that transforms me and makes me more like him, man. Davidic fathers, Davidic leadership. There's a lot of leaders hearing me right here. It's the presence. It's the presence. It's not identity. If you need a pulpit to feel better about yourself or a platform, then you really don't need a pulpit. <laughs> See, fathers teach you this. True fathers teach you how to get a word instead of telling you to come see me preach so you can get a word. Five, true fathers say, you don't need me to lay hands on you because I'm teaching you to lay hands on others. True fathers because they're reproducing the presence, the glory that's on them in their sons and daughters, man. See, when you go to Matthew 6, 6 into that secret place, it rewards you in the open. Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom. Seek first his agenda, then it'll be all about yours. But Saul had it mixed up. Hey, I'm king, I'm pastor, I'm worship leader, I'm apostle, Billy, whoever you are. God, breathe out what I want to do. No. See, first the kingdom. See, when you get all in and you make yourself a reputation, you know what your reward is? You get to be a part of what he's doing. You get to be a carrier of the greater glory. Second Chronicles 16, 9 said, The eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro, looking for whom he may stand strong on their behalf, whose heart is set on him and his will. Man. So you understand, true fathers, Davidic fathers will work ministers out of a job. That's the goal. Because you can get your own word. You can lay hands and heal the sick. You can prophesy and establish heaven's government, man. It says this in Hebrews 10. It says, I think it's 23 and 24, 24 and 25. But it says, we come together to be stirred in love and good works. That's why we come here, to get stirred. To get stirred. We got to get away from that Saul mentality, man. Jesus, Matthew 18, 11, Jesus came to restore that which was lost. We were orphans. We were lost sons and daughters. With legacy and destiny. He restored it. He restored it. We got to get away from this rapture mentality. It's getting tough on the earth. Oh, man. I can't wait for Jesus to come back. When a divinity father, when a true father, Jesus restored that which was lost. He didn't pay the price for you to come to heaven. He paid the price for heaven to come back into you. For you to be Esther 414. His answer in such a time as this, man. That's what the presence does. He says, it's not about being raptured and going up, but it's about growing up. Oops. Oops. 
You know, Ephesians 4.13 talks about maturing and growing up into the fullness of the stature of Christ, man. You are his answer. It says in 1 John 4.17, as he is, so are you in this world. But you got to be a wise master builder. Holy Spirit, man. Let's deal with my heart conditions, man. I got to position myself around a father, a divinic, true father. And when I do that, I'm getting quickened. And I'm going from one realm of glory to another one, 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we got to mature, man. We got to mature. You are his answer. Colossians 1.22 says that he is presenting us blameless and above reproach. How about you presenting some people blameless and above reproach to the Father? How about you laying down your life and really becoming love? Because love never seeks its own. Love keeps no record of wrongs done to Love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't behave rudely. It hopes all things. It trusts all things. It believes all things. Because it is in the presence, man. And you know your daddy is able. And he's confirming it with the people, by the people. Oh, man. You're the answer. You're the answer. 2 Corinthians 3, 2 says that you are the living epistle for the world to read. What are they reading? You know, the Lord had said this to me a while back. He said, a lot of people, most people don't have a problem with me. They have a problem with my bride. Something happens to us, we look worse than the world sometimes. Oops, nobody in here, I know you guys are <laughs> pure and cool. But people, somebody's watching you, believe me. Believe me, you have a sphere of influence, man. You have a sphere of influence. And they don't understand the warfare. Oh yeah, I did that, but I love Jesus. You know, people might doubt what you say, but they'll never doubt what you do. They'll never doubt what you do. A great leader, a Davidic leader, has sons and daughters around them that carry authority and power that have become nothing because they and, and focus on leaving a legacy. A chain reaction in the Holy Ghost, man. A love revolution, man. I tell you, I cry for it every day. A love revolution to sweep the nations, man. To not just sweep the city. And the state, but the nations, man, that the name of Jesus would be exalted and glorified. And that they would receive their inheritance when they made us in their image, man. Are you living for what, man? The fire burns hottest in a secret place, I'm telling you. We can't have no more excuses. We must be co-laborers. We must be wise master builders from 1 Corinthians 3. We cannot be led by feelings, thoughts, and emotions that do not produce life. But I'll tell you, some of you might be sitting there right now. Man, I said, show me your scars from Saul's leadership. You got a whole bunch of them. See, Saul constricts and constrains. With your father, there's a free flow of love. With the Davidic leader, there's a free flow of love, which brings the authority and power. Where you see miracle signs and wonders on a daily basis, where the presence of God is just leaking off you. Yeah. That's why it is what it is right here, right now. This is the glory of God. But there's more. But there's more. And 
And then there's more when you get that more. And then there's more when you get that more. And then there's more when you get that more. Oh, he's, he's endless. He's endless, man. But you got to understand, we got to destroy this orphan kingdom mentality. We got to. You know, Malachi 4, 5, 6, he says, In the last days, I will bring the fathers back to the children and the children back to the fathers. Hmm. These are the last days. This is the seventh church age of Laodicea, the lukewarm church, lacking over to the end of generation. This is the time, church. This is the time, leaders. This is the time, brothers and sisters. This is the time. And I'll tell you, if you haven't found your Davidic leader, maybe it's because you're called to be the Davidic leader. But I promise you, every Davidic leader will go through the school of Saul. You got to go through the school of Saul, and God allows us to get the Saul out of you so that you will never do to anybody else. <laughs> Understand, church. Understand what's going on here, man. David served Saul to get Saul out of him. You've all served, myself too. We've served some whack leadership. But praise God, we know now. David would not harm Saul. He says, no, he was appointed king by the father. No, the prophets appointed him. Uh-uh, I'm not doing it. I don't care what the world says until the father tells me. It doesn't matter what the world says. You got to understand. The center of the flame is the only safe place. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. We got to reverse the curse of Saul's kingdom. You know, 1 Corinthians 9 2, Saul, Paul says this I'm your apostle. He's duplicated sons and daughters after his own kind. He says, I'm your apostle. You are my, you are proof that I'm a divinity father. You are proof that I value the presence above all things. You are proof that I reproduce after my own kind. Because I, I deny myself, I pick up my cross and I follow him. I don't follow my agenda. I don't follow a feeling, thought, or emotion, or a way that seems right to a man, but ends in destruction. We need this love revolution. Go to 2 Samuel 6 and we're going to close there. David becomes king. And the first thing he does is goes and gets the Ark of the Covenant back. The enemy, David, Saul was so busy worrying about chasing David, he lost the presence of God. He lost the Ark of the Covenant. All these years of history. David said, I'm king now. We're going to get it from the enemy. He got it too. He got it. But I want to show you something. Start at verse 3. <clears throat> so they set the ark, <clears throat> the presence of God, on a new cart. Where are you setting the presence of God? You get in his presence. You conform to the Holy Spirit and quit trying to put him on a cart to conform to your way and building your kingdom, man. They put it on the cart. They're doing it. They're bringing it back into the city. The oxen stumble. Somebody touches the ark that they shouldn't. God kills them instantly. 
David was like, whoa, God, that's bogus. He thinks he knows something. You know, Saul always thought he knew something. I'll kill David, and I'll stay king. God anointed him. God appointed him. God has chosen you. It doesn't matter what people say or do. Get the presence above all things, man. Get around a Davidic leader. Get away from the Saul leadership, man. A tree is known by its fruit. What well, your experience in your secret place, you should be experiencing everywhere. Be led by the Holy Ghost. What you're feeling here right now, you're a carrier of it, man. Believe it. I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more. I'm hungry. The hungry got to eat. I tell you, that's for me. I, there ain't nobody getting hungrier than me. I'm telling you, I stay hungry. I stay hungry. I'm about 980 pounds in the spirit, man. I'm like the beaches that way. I'm telling you, I'm flexing in the spirit, man. Big Fred ain't got nothing on me. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You got to eat, man. See, in the natural, when you eat, you get full. But in the realm of the spirit, in the secret place, when you eat, you get hungrier. Whoa. It's an inside, outside, flipped upside down kingdom, man. That's a whole story for another day. But so David gets mad because the ox stumbles. And then all of a sudden he goes, Let's take the ark over to Obed-Edom's house. Then he starts hearing, hey, that whole house is blessed. It's, whoa, 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 hold him up, Jim. Hold him up. No, no, we're going to revamp this thing. We're going to bring them in. We're going to bring them in. We're going to bring them in. So David, verse 15, and the house of Israel brought the Ark of the Covenant with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. He got everybody together. He said, there ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. I mean, he was having a party for real, man. I'm telling you. Everybody's dancing, shopping, getting jiggy with it. I'm telling you, they got the instruments. What are you? They're doing it, doing it, doing it right. I'm telling you, man. Now the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Micah, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. And she despised him. Why? Because David was dancing so hard he fell out of his clothes. Because she did this, she never had a child. She was barren. I'm telling you, the barren people will tell you that's not God. The barren people will say that's not the glory. The barren people will say, oh, just come on over here and hang with me for a while, man. The barren people. But you got to get radical. You got to get to worshiping. You got to start getting jiggy with it, man. You got to purpose with all your heart to go lower so that you can soar higher, so that you can be entrusted with the greater glory. For this is the new 2020 is the new. This is a time of reformation. It's a time of war. But that means people are being equipped with weapons. People are getting ready for battle. It's an exposure of both good and bad. Those that have qualified in the prior seasons, those that are qualifying today, are going to get equipped with new mantles, new anointings, new calling. But only if you give him all the glory. Only if you be all in for his kingdom to come and his will to be done. In you, to you, and through you, on the earth as it is in heaven. I'm telling you, this is what it's about, church. This is what it's about. I love you guys, man. I'm going to be here a few more weeks, man. Man, I'm telling you, I'm trying to get everything into you guys as I can, man. I travel a lot. I'm going to be traveling a lot more. 
Can you set that up? But understand, this is what's being offered to you. 